Welcome to The Longer Game. If you're listening, you're listening to a show about retail being reimagined. If you'd like to connect with The Longer Game, look for The Longer Game at thelongergame.com and on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn at The Longer Game. We're here to talk about retail, why it's changing, how it's changing, and what you can expect in the future. We're not trying to take ourselves too seriously, but we do want to know what that retail landscape is going to look like. I hope you enjoy your time listening to this podcast. We try to keep it as quick as possible because we don't want to waste your time, but we want to keep you informed. Thanks for tuning in. Now, here's the show. The Longer Game, where we don't just talk about retail, we talk about the future of retail. And everybody likes the future because it's not real. It doesn't actually exist. It's only now. There is only now. Just like Bruce Lee, I believe, said, there is no try, only do. And I tell my daughter that, and she gets it. Um, There is no future. There is only now. And I believe Kanye West also said that my presence is your present. Something, something, kiss my ass. I'm not exactly sure. I'll have to go back and look up that line. But anyway, today on the show, I have my friend James Say What Sales Buckley from Sell of, of Sell Better by JB Sales. That's a long ass title. Why don't you explain to people what you actually do, Mr. Yeah. Buckley? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show, Michael. I appreciate your time. Uh, big fan. And you and I have been friends a while. This is a real treat for me. Yeah, uh, so I am with Sell Better by JB Sales. And basically what we do is we provide sales training for frontline sales reps, SDRs, account executives, customer success reps, uh, people that are full cycle sales. We help them sell better consistently. So this is continuous learning and development on my side of the fence. So we provide a subscription service where people can come and learn the best ways to be SDR, the best ways to be an account executive, the best ways to be customer success. Uh, And then at the same time, the other side of the fence is that we have real trainers that come out, Leslie Douglas, Shelly Gupta Correa, Meg Holsinger, they come out and actually train your team. So it's like in-person live training that will change everything about the way your sellers think. So we have two ways to deliver, and those are the best ways possible for us to be providing continuous learning and development for our sellers. So that was great. And I believe I know some of those acronyms like SDR and stuff like that. But for the people that are, yeah. that are retail focused and might be acronym sure. challenged, I guess sure. we'll, we'll say. Um, I'll, I'll break it down. So SDR stands for sales development representative. Typically, these are people that do cold calls. They do cold emails. Uh, they do outreach, right? You sometimes you'll hear this as BDR, business development representative yeah. or sales representative, right? Usually this is top of the funnel stuff. So uh, basically get attention from people that have no intention of giving me any today and then create interest enough for them to take the next step, which is a deeper, longer conversation about whatever I sell. The account executive, the AE, those are the people that actually close. So SDRs set meetings with account executives and prospects. Those prospects meet the account executives. The account executives provide amazing customer experiences in, mm. in theory. <laughs> and yeah, then, or they should be. They should or be. they shit the bed, however you might want to say it, right? <laughs> yeah, but whatever. either way, the customer decides based on that experience whether or not they're going to move forward and purchase. Once they purchase... Okay. CS or customer success is responsible for training, onboarding, maintaining that account so that they renew at the end of their contract and upsells and cross sells and adoption. This is all the product of customer success. So those are the three teams and those teams are laid out by what some people would refer to as the software Bible, predictable revenue. That's the model that many software companies use to build their companies and their teams. That's actually, a so that's a great insight because a lot of the people that I talk to in in retail and specifically in the Amazon community, because it is all online, are SaaS companies. They've got uh, advertising softwares, customer follow-up, feedback, automation, tracking products, keyword research, all this stuff. There's a ton of SaaS companies. So software as a a sales... Wait, so software, software as, as a, a service. service. Software you. as a service is what SaaS stands for. It's not for like she's got aren't. a nice SaaS or he's got a nice SaaS. It's like actually that. I have a shirt that says "Nice SaaS." Oh, okay. <laughs> that I need. I need to find one of those um, <laughs> and turn it around so people uh, so people see it. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I. But the the, the if if you want to look at Amazon as its own ecosystem because it really is. Amazon is this huge bubble. And for anyone who's just listening, just imagine like the earth, okay? So there's there's this huge 
bubble that is Amazon. It's this whole ecosystem. And the sellers are like a Mount Kilimanjaro, like a little speck that's that's really fueling the whole entire earth. Maybe we maybe we say rainforest is is a better um, idea. I don't know, but it's like this bubble on top of this much larger bubble that helps sell you know three hundred and ten billion dollars worth of sales here in the U.S. last year, and then on that bubble that is the sellers, there's a conjoined bubble between the sellers in Amazon. And that's where a service agency works uh, like myself. That's where the SaaS companies work and live. That's where all those companies live and they help to bring those two things together. And what's, what's funny is it, is it works. It, it, they're, they're, those, those service agencies are able to help brands to be more successful in that area. Um, and I love how you broke it down into uh, SDR, BDR, AE. Typically when I'm looking to prospect, I'm looking to connect with, for my target audience or my, my ICP, my ideal client profile, I'm looking for, you know, for a smaller company, it might be a CEO, a founder, uh, it could be a CMO. Uh, it, depending upon the size of the company though, and how much leeway someone has, I really kind of need CEO buy-in because they can, they can always squash the deal if they want to, or if they don't like something and they've got ultimate control and they don't maybe trust that person, they can kind of, you know, pull that back and that can be hurtful to the project. And I've seen it happen before where I just was eager to get the sale and didn't think about that. Well, sometimes they have existing relationships too. I can't tell you how many deals yes. that we have gotten to the table with. And you're like this far away from getting it over the finish line. And then suddenly there's this curveball that comes your way. About oh, I know so and so, and she's got. Yeah, crazy. Our, our CRO knows this other person at your competitor, and you know they want to talk to them first before we move forward. And then you're right back to square one. And it's it's usually you can tie this back to the salesperson not closing the loop early enough. Okay, and the and the the sales cycle doesn't necessarily have to be i mean i guess you probably know what an average sales cycle looks like it, it, it depends it's I've different had... it's different depending on your average contract value it's different depending on typically longer account... the greater value is that what you're is the, that where you well yeah that? i mean the greater yeah. the value think about it like this if you're working if your ideal clients ha are small meaning they have 10 to 20 employees there's probably one, maybe two decision makers at the table there. Yeah. But if you're working an enterprise deal with a company like Salesforce or GE or, you know, any giant organization out there that doesn't need to, that has like brand recognition and they have thousands of employees, there's hundreds of people that are yeah. involved in making that decision. So you can expect a longer sales cycle because you need buy-in from all the stakeholders. Um, the Challenger Sale is a great book that I always recommend. Uh, for sellers. And it states that there's an average of like 6.5 decision makers at every organization. Oh, wow. 6.5. Okay. That, now that might be true for small and medium businesses, but I guarantee you that at an enterprise organization at the corporate level, there are 50, 60, upwards of 100 decision makers involved in some instances. And that's so incredibly more complex. Putting numbers on things. Okay. Well, okay. So I, I can appreciate that. But one of the one of the people that I would want to connect with is a business development person, VP of business development, because they're looking for new opportunities to grow the business. Amazon is an opportunity for them to, you know, increase sales channel and the future of retail. From my eyes and the, the way that the the show talks about the the laundry game talks about retail is being omnichannel. For anyone who doesn't know, it's really just selling across multiple channels. There's so many opportunities to connect with the consumer. And by the way, I love how it's being phrased as customer success and not, I know customer success is still kind of like account management. You're still, you're, you're building a relationship yeah. with the client. It used to be. It yeah. used to be. Okay. And, but I, but I was going to say, I like the term customer success. And on our team, we say the customer experience manager because they're managing the experience with the consumer. It's not just customer service. Customer service is calling and saying, hey, I want this thing fixed. And then them just blocking you and hanging up the phone. Like that's what, that's the idea that people have about customer service, but we're really working on experience. We're creating a better experience for people with these products, how they interact with the products, what they see when they open up the box, all that stuff makes a big difference and it can create more brand loyalty 
or it can create less or, or nothing, which is ultimately less anyway. I, I wonder sometimes when we talk about customer experience, I wonder sometimes how much customer experience leads to shelfware problems. So I talk about shelfware. People buy products that end up sitting on a shelf and collecting dust and they don't use them. And yeah. I think sometimes people buy services that are exactly the same. Mm hmm right? We buy this service, we pay this money and we expect results, but then I never reach out to the person I bought it from. I never try to adopt it into my flows, my process, right? And if, if you're not willing to change, no matter what you buy, it's probably not yeah. going to improve your business. And from a retail perspective, change is inevitable. Yes. Retail, retail specifically, and I'm talking to everyone out there that, that does retail right now, run full sprint towards change and try different things to improve your sales. And they don't all have to be in store. We were talking before we kicked this off yeah. about this balance that you're seeing as being prominent, especially generationally, between in-store and online purchases. Grocery was the one that we brought up that's like super changing, right? Yeah, I mean, during the pandemic, people had no choice because of either laws saying you have to stay inside or only one person from your home can go out or, I mean, I don't, it's not like it was China and people were getting um, taken and handcuffed that I know of. Uh, I haven't been everywhere in the U S so I, I can't, <laughs> I can't say that's, you know, totally valid, but yeah, people were essentially forced to buy things online yeah. and realized, Oh, okay. This is maybe more convenient than I expected. Uh, I have, you know, anecdotally people, someone that I brought on the show and her grandma started using Amazon Prime uh, or became a Prime member and started using Amazon uh, during the pandemic and she loves it and she hasn't come back. So, I mean, there's there's adoption forced based on your environment. Maybe you so there's an entire generation that. of octogenarians and 70 year olds and yeah. 60 year olds that have sworn for decades that they will never adopt smart technology. Yeah. And they've got the smartphone in their hand. Fast forward to 2020, March yeah. and after. These people are having FaceTime calls with their families for the first time. They're adopting technologies. That they, they want to never, see their families. They never, yeah, exactly. And they never thought that they would ever be those people. And this is something that I think is happening in business too. We're starting to see entire locations, retail locations, shut down and move to online. We're starting to see retail yeah. locations that only have examples of things especially clothing apparel yeah. right it only has an example it's a kiosk and it has an example it's not your size but that's okay if you like it here let's order it online and we'll send it to you and if you don't like it you can always send it back and you can this get is, it in a day you can get it in two days get it in two days get how much do you want to pay how soon do you need it right this is like the that's way that's literally the how i imagine the model of retail going like even big companies like walmart as people and as they go towards their own marketplace growth, people are going to start to adopt that model more. And I truly believe they can start utilizing their stores more as fulfillment centers and maybe take up, you know, a third of the space where people can just view things and they say, okay, you want this? Great. Scan it. We'll have it to you later today, or it'll be shipped to you tomorrow. Or like you said, you know, how much do you want to pay? Whatever, whatever the case might be, or we want it express or hey, this will get to you in a week. Are you okay with that? And people are more adopted to that model. And to your point about going, uh, you know, increasing adoption across demographics, in-store is still where majority of the purchases are being made, but e-commerce took a huge jump when the pandemic hit and it hasn't slowed down. And what I've seen grow and based on the research that I've done recently, because I'm building something great, can't tell you about it right now, but just wait, it's gonna be awesome. And that, that part of it is the part of it that I think retail has to catch on to is that change equals growth and progress. And if they're not changing with the generations and or adapting to be able to suit all generations, we have a breakdown in the way that our business pipeline moves, our growth pipeline yeah. moves. Because I want to be able to say, here's what we offer. How would you like it? Yeah. That part of it is the new wave. Uh, I remember the old wave. I worked very briefly for about a year as a manager at the Dollar General. If you know anything about the Dollar General, you know that this is 100% location-based. 
You cannot, you cannot go. I don't, can you go to dollargeneral.com and order.com stuff? Can you order online at the Dollar General? This is a good question, I guess. First uh, of all, I'm looking right now, I have no idea. Let's talk, let's talk a little bit about how these locations spring up because in my area, I live in East Tennessee. These locations spring up overnight. It's almost as if a crane comes in with an already built yeah. store and just drops it on this concrete pad and then everyone starts shopping there the next day. It's the strangest thing I've ever seen. They come up out of nowhere. Yeah. But one thing that I don't think they do well is so you online. can buy, but they but they say some things just say in store only. They do have a shopping cart. They so. do have a shopping cart then. Okay. But I don't know how much they're actually doing in, in so I believe that even retail stores like the Dollar General are going to move towards the Walmart model. If you're not familiar with how Walmart does online shopping these days, I shop at Walmart here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. When yeah. you go in there, you see lots of employees with carts that have all these buggies on them, these car these crates on them, and those crates have papers. Those papers are orders. People have gone through and placed their Walmart grocery order, and the pickers, as they call them, go through the store and grab all the things that that person ordered, and right. then the person will show up at their at their parking lot and have to park in a specific space, yep. and then they, they they go on the app and they say, I'm here. And the grocery store people come out, even put it in their car for them. Yeah. You never even have to leave your vehicle. And what's crazy is that was around years before but when the pandemic hit. Uh, Kroger has capitalized on it. Uh, Walmart it became, has capitalized on it. Target, it became the norm. Yeah. <laughs> and, and certain places like Instacart, which are super grocery focused, but are expanding categories. They're allowing you uh, to get stuff delivered to your door. Same with Amazon and Whole Foods. Getting stuff delivered to your uh, to your to your door. Uh, Prime Now, um, Prime yeah. Grocery became or Prime Now. I think Prime Grocery became Prime Now, or Prime Now became Prime Grocery. Publix, so, Publix yeah. did it too, and they used to they used to have guys come to your door with your groceries, and they had little footies that they would put on their shoes so oh. they didn't track mud in your door. Yeah, it was. That's a actually very time. considerate. I have a good story, but but I, I might tell that. At another time, <laughs> my mother-in-law. I don't think she'd care. I think she'd think it's funny. But anyway, um, I I think the buying, to, speaking to your point about buying a service that is shelfware, there are many software companies, many SaaS companies. I can say from the Amazon space that sell you their solution like they're an agency but it literally is just a software that you turn on that doesn't build strategy for you. So you can't just, unless they're a full service agency and they're saying, Hey, here's our strategy and we're going to utilize our tool that we've created to help you. And that's part of the selling. Well then great. Like that's awesome. But many people say, yeah, well we, someone sold us on this software uh, and it didn't really do much for us. And I'm like, well, yeah, of course it didn't do anything because all you did was just put your products in this conveyor belt that just moved around, but it didn't necessarily move it to the front of the store. It did like you're you're just you're you're putting it in a cycle of something, but you're not necessarily putting it in a cycle where it's going to get to the front and get visibility. You're playing the chance game. game, is what you're playing, right? You're there's hoping no, you're no going to get lucky. Strategy there, it's just hope. Hope, and while hope does float. It does not actually make sales. I'm just saying that based on the movie. I don't so know Roderick it, Jefferson but. is a sales enablement mentor that I've looked up to for a very long time. And Roderick- I've talked to him only briefly online, but he was a very nice gentleman. Roderick is very knowledgeable, extremely well-versed, like a wealth of information. And one of the hashtags he uses is hope is not a strategy. And yes, believe, that's where it is. That's where I've seen it. Okay, yeah, thank you. I believe that that is a hundred percent true. And too yeah. many of us go into business, especially retail, with false senses of hope. We yes. are betting our success on chance. How and many that, people have I? Go ahead. Go ahead. That is not a strategy that is going to yield results that you're after. It's going to yield frustration. It's going to yield confusion. It's going to yield a lot of process problems that you probably don't need. If you plan better and you understand. So I used to work for a company called Crossmark out of Florida. I don't know if you're familiar. Crossmark. I'm, I'm not. So uh, Crossmark would go in and remove all of the items off the shelves at Publix. And then they would put new planograms together. So they'd give you the layout of what it should uh. look like. And then you would go and you would take all the out of date foods and stuff and, you know, get rid of those. 
you know, and then you would put all of the things back on the shelves according to the new planogram. This was like based on sales. So the best selling things went at about eye level. Yeah. Right. The worst selling things went way down at the ankles. <laughs> but we're so talking about Mark would do this. Right and yeah. I mean, this was like, we'd get there at two in the morning and we had to be done by 7 30 AM before they closed or before they opened. Yeah. Right. So it was quite the rush. There was about 150 of us in one location, just ripping everything off the stores, putting it all in crates, moving it all out, putting the new shelves in order oh, and then getting it all back on the shelves. And it was quite the ordeal without online services. This is much more constant. Yeah. Because quarterly it's always being redone based on sales. Yeah. Online, none of those factors exist. That workforce is not needed. Well, tech sort of, the, the online community um, is seeing a shift in what's going on at eye level, but it's all done in the moment. And it's ah. done based on sales history and sales velocity. So eye level and looks a little different than in the online world. Eye level is page one. I mean, m most people, uh, if specifically for Amazon, I've heard anywhere from 70 to 90% of people don't go past page one. And guess what? On a sales call, that crushes because the odds are in my favor that that person will say, yep, I don't go past page one because majority of people don't go past page one. And to make it even more difficult for people, if you're not leveraging, there was a period where I did not embrace change with my business when I was running an e-commerce business. And one of the things I did not embrace was Amazon's uh, prime shipping. And that was a big mistake. I thought, oh, they just, they want more, um, they want more money. And, and and I was I was not thinking about it straight. And if I had adopted Prime sooner and put more products in Prime and really gotten competitive, my, maybe my business would still be going. I don't want, I didn't want it to still be going. I'm, I'm so much better off in the service side of, th side of things. I'm I'm I believe I'm you know fulfilling my purpose and I'm doing a better job. But you know, embracing Prime was a necessity. And now the 147 million Prime members that are here in the US that are on their mobile phones because 70% of people are shopping mobile on Amazon that are on the app or on the website. All they do is just click prime. There's a little prime button. Amazon just put that little small filter there. It looks like it's not that big of a deal. If you're not utilizing Amazon's fulfillment system, guess what? Product disappears. What happened to it? It's not prime eligible. So someone that's got a prime membership and wants it now, it doesn't matter whether they need it now or not, they want it now. And Amazon has trained them to want it now. So much so that when the pandemic hit, there were delays in shipments naturally because of uh, factories being shut down or delay in products being shipped. China was, was um, delayed on sending things over. There are there a multitude of things that happened, but some consultants that I would talk with are like, man, I didn't get my order within two days. And I was like, man, oh, I'm so frustrated. And then I'm like, oh, like, I realized we're in the middle of a pandemic. There's a lot of other things going on, but it was just crazy how I'm conditioned to with prime think I want, I want it in two days or now one day, or sometimes get it by seven to 7 AM to 11 AM tomorrow. Um, that is a motivator for people. When you see, I can get something in my hands in seven to eight hours. If it's like midnight, that's crazy. And that motivates people to make, quick purchase decisions, which people are doing, making really quick purchase decisions. But I think overall, people, what, to, back to your point about hope is not a strategy, 100%. If you are hoping that things are going to work out, but there's no real action or there's no change in momentum that you're, there's no change in direction even of what you're doing and you just continue to do the same thing and hoping it's going to be different. Like that's that's not anything. That's just... I think part of what you're talking about is an ignorance, though, because most people experience Amazon and retail in general as a swipe right experience. When we buy online, we, we're on the buyer's side of the equation. So yeah. to us, it was super easy to buy this. Yep. I did a quick search. I found one that I like. I swiped right. I double clicked so my credit card would go through. And then it showed up at my door a couple days later. When we are on the selling side, there is a lot happening on the back end so much, that so much. nobody sees on the buyer side. Yeah. 
So because that's true, our belief, and this was my belief too for a very long time until I met you and many other people that work in this space, my belief was all I need is inventory and a picture and I can put this online on Amazon and make money. And that used to be the case a decade ago. Not uh, so much the case anymore. <laughs> well, so uh, I, I think that many sellers, especially sellers that remember what it was like a decade ago, we default there. We yes. still believe that's the case. And I've seen brands on the fail other side because of, of that. I've, I've seen brands dig their heels in and say, well, this is this is how we're going to do it. And I just say, well, then it's not going to end up being successful. It's not going to work. I, and I want to see you succeed. I don't know if this is going to, this is a relationship we want to continue to invest in. I've had to let a client go before because they, were, they weren't the best client in general and, and they were not very nice to our team. But they just kept saying that we don't need to change this. We don't need to change this. And I said, well, there's a reason why sales have gone down, you know, 80% or 75% over the past four years. Yeah. Because the saddest, doing words, the saddest words at any company looking to grow is we've always done this way. Yeah. And I'm like, great. Keep doing it that way and you will not succeed. But it wasn't for me. I'm like, you have a great brand and you're legitimately running it into the ground because of pride, because you're saying we don't need to change this. And well, they're either running it into the ground or they have a great brand, but they don't know how to use it. They don't know how to monetize it. But they, but in having a great brand and not knowing how to monetize it, they're letting it be covered up by the dirt that all the other people that are digging ditches faster and, and you know building up the dollar generals that appear like that super quick they're letting that dirt start to cover them up and then they get pushed to the back and pushed to the back and they become less visible. So that that planogram that, that you're talking about is essentially happening on a marketplace like Amazon in almost real time. And if you go out of stock, guess what? Your product doesn't show up anymore. There's no coming back soon. I mean, th there's a way that you can do that, but there's no real coming back soon um, product. You get out of stock and someone else fills that shelf. And here's what's even crazier. When you get back in stock, you now have, because the search algorithm is basing where you're placed on your previous sales history and sales velocity, but you've lost sales history compared to everybody else. Your sales velocity is down compared to everybody else. You don't go back in that same placement. You have to earn that. And a lot of times you have to run discounted promotions, increased money on advertising, not necessarily getting more clicks, but spending more on those clicks to get back into that position that you wanted to get in. So there, there a lot of, a lot of it is the same, but it's different players. Um, the people that are, uh, that you said are not needed. Yeah. They're kind of not needed, but the people who built the search algorithm that were part of the planogram, those are the people that are needed. So it looks different. And that's, I think like with any industry that changes, you look at the industrial, uh, revolution, or the, the industrial uh, era when things went from, you know, horse and buggy to eventually to a car or human hands to a machine. And there's a lot of crazy stuff that happened then, but everyone said, okay, we're all going to be out of jobs, but guess what? People have to build those machines and people have to um, come up with uh, ways to make those machines efficient and build them and put them in uh, a warehouse. And then people have to still run and operate the machines. There's just different skill sets that are, that are acquired. When farming went from being uh, manual to being more machine operated, there were new skill sets that needed to happen maybe on the back end and there were less jobs on the front end, but it probably took, you know, a decade for all that to, to pan out. So like now people are talking about robotics and automation and we're going to be replaced and blah, 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 blah. I think people are, I think people are a little nutso in saying that because there's still people have to develop code. People still have to, um, learn about robotics and help develop the subject matter and do experiments. Uh, there will be other jobs that can be created now, people who uh, go in and maintain the machines, uh, even though the machines are doing the packing and picking of, of something like an Amazon warehouse. Those people don't move anymore, from my understanding. They literally typing in, I need like an FJ711654 and a, a uh, I know, um, a machine goes under it's like it's like a uh a skid holder i can't i can't think of a of a different oh name. yeah i know what you mean i worked logistics for a while skid holder i know what it means <laughs> so but without the handle and it literally it's like robotic it goes in picks up this this stack of products this high 
that there might be 20 different products on there and the other sizes or even that same product might be on like 10 other things of those and uh, of those little you know stacks and they bring them to the person that's picking and packing put it in something and then it gets put on the line so their their people are still doing stuff but in, in a lot of warehouses machines are going out and doing some of those work so there's still a need and amazon's hiring an even more, greater workforce why because e-commerce is growing so they need more people to to hire and more machines to hire at the same time so it's all great for products right i hear a lot about products and that's amazing what i'm looking forward to is services eventually like bleeding their way into the Amazon world. So I imagine this to be like, uh, you know, going to amazon.com and be, or Amazon prime and being like pest control. And then it's like Orkin's packages laid out for you and you can select which one you want. I imagine it to be like sales training. And it's like, here are a hundred sales trainers that you could reach out to to talk about how they can help your team, right? So I'm interested in the future of Amazon selling service-wise because that's the piece that's missing. There's yeah. not a lot of services on Amazon. It's almost always product because shipping is involved. Right, and and the the one thing that is, I'm like, my lights are flickering and I don't, like you can, I can tell there's a storm in the background. I'm like, okay, this is getting really interesting uh, right here, Some, something's <laughs> going on. Anyway, anyway, you're, you're right. But there, there are some services, but it's like local professionals who set up a treadmill or set right. up a, a place that they can go and they can sell their services. Um, me as a service provider for an Amazon brand, there's a specific place where I can have my services. They're not sold, but they're just put up there. I've been approved to be a part of their network. Cartology is up there. And if people want to contact us, they can get in touch. Yeah. Um, but having relationships with someone who's a part of say the new seller success team, that's probably going to work better for me than just being up on a website. But I do believe that that service piece is something that's missing where, where Amazon has put a lot of effort and focus is the B2B side of things. So they have Amazon business and what I believe they've imagined would happen is as people start to adopt e-commerce more purchasing departments at places can get a PO and could potentially get a, a discount uh, of the pens that they buy now on amazon.com because there's special business pricing. But if you got a tax ID, you get to be tax exempt or whatever the case might be because uh, you're not using it for resale, you're just whatever. So that's something they've invested a lot of money and time into. I don't know how much that's gonna pay off. I've seen there are for some businesses that B2B could be great. Uh, the B2C, or the D to C app, whatever you want to call it, that's really where it's winning right now. What, what is what is winning right now? I think services could be could be even larger than that because services help run things. I mean, services make things happen. Products are just products. They they do and or they don't. But I feel like the next work. evolution of Amazon has to be some level of service added to the mix. And I imagine people being like. You know, hey, congrats on all your success. I've been seeing all the updates you've been putting out on social. Hey, I'm curious, how did you get where you're at? And somebody, like, oh, on Amazon, I went and I, I got this service and it's helped me to get here. I've been using it for the last year. I, subs I resubscribe every year. It's really helpful. Like that kind of thing you don't hear very often. You hear a lot about products that people buy on Amazon. Oh, where'd you get that dress? I got it on Amazon, yeah. right? Oh, nice shoes. Where'd you pick those up? I bought Where did you Amazon. get that dress, by the way? I did get it on Amazon, as a matter of fact. Okay. <laughs> mine, mine too. Um, I just want you guys to let that image sink in real quick. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm I'm actually curious now because I don't think that's something that Amazon would go after. I feel you don't like think so? I, I, I don't know because they've been so product focused. They have invested billions of dollars in their logistics network. And I don't know how they would leverage that with the services side of things. I think it could be something that they do eventually add. I'm just trying to think in my head, is this something based on what I know about Amazon that they would want to go and pursue? What what I think is 20, let's, let's say 20 years ago, if you just said Amazon will eventually get into the streaming space and start yeah. and start providing movies to they people. They will produce content. Producing yeah. their own content. Everyone would have been like, nah, that'll never happen. They sell books. <laughs> 
that's a, that's a really good, that's a really good point. So may, maybe there's like, there's been some projects that have come out. Uh, some friends of mine who, who work at Amazon or have worked on something called uh, buy with prime. So that's something that just got released and it's not Amazon pay uh, websites uh, that are on Shopify or WooCommerce, what, wherever you're host at big commerce, Magento, there's a ton of platforms. Yeah. You can, have your Amazon account and log in and pay with your Amazon information. So you don't have to give it to, you know, a credit card company or anywhere else that's already secure. You just log in with Amazon. Well, now companies that have products that are fulfilled by Amazon. And so they're selling on Amazon. You can now have prime shipping be available on your item, on your website. You, someone just logs into their account and on your site with Amazon and it says buy with prime. And it's as simple as, you know, adding to cart and then buying now. Uh, and then you get directed back to the website once you're done. And honestly, I think for merchants, it's going to be cheaper and they'll get more conversions because the cost of shipping that they're going to have to pay, I think is going to be a lot less than they would pay when utilizing Amazon. So people see fees and like, oh, Amazon takes 15%, a referral fee, like, ouch, that's a lot. And I think, okay, well, you had to, for your own website, you had to build the site, you have to continue to keep it updated in the code fresh. You have to, you know, do UI tests, your split testing, you're looking, pay for analytics and someone to help you with analytics. You have to pay for people to list product. You have to pay for people to drive traffic to this. Like by the time we get up there, 15%, I think doesn't really even sound that bad. And you can definitely be profitable on Amazon. It's just, I, I look at, out. I look at that 15% and I say, well, nobody works for free. And that is a hundred percent true. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's exactly how it should be looked at. But that old mindset is, well, I'm used to, um, you know, someone only taking 2% or 3% like a credit card company. And you know what really gets me, there's not a lot of things that really truly irk me, but even, even small businesses that accept credit cards, they start to pass those fees onto someone, they're, they're, they're saying, hey, you're choosing to use a credit card, which is a common form of payment. There's a 3% processing fee that goes with that. They're now taking their costs and saying, hey, you should pay for that. Hey, you know the delivery cost for someone to deliver donuts yeah. to us in the morning so you can have them? There's an extra charge for that because it costs to deliver. And in my yeah, There head, are retailers that don't take American Express because the cost of using a, is taking American Express payment is higher than other cards. And I just, the, the thing that drives me nuts is why, why are you pushing consumers away? Like there, there's, it's not like some, some places will say, no, we don't take card. I heard my mother-in-law say this. No, we don't take card, but we take cash or check. A check. Who's writing checks? If you're still out there writing checks, like, I and don't who, know. who has a check on, on them, who's writing them? And do you really know this person well enough to accept that? Accept a check. Right. <laughs> That's crazy. All right. Well, I might run out of power here. And so I think this is probably a good place. We didn't even talk about some of the stuff that I wanted to talk to. So I think there maybe is a part two coming. We'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, you heard it here first. Uh, he's in. You can see my lights flickering. This is crazy. Uh, JB, Mr. James, say what sales Buckley. Where can people find you if they want to know more about you? Or could they find you, say, buying a dress on Amazon? Could they find you at a Dollar General? Uh, freshly shopping the next day when it's opened up, where would people? Uh, you can find me in the club with a bottle full of bub. No, I oh, um, no. holla what you need. <laughs> so you, you can need, find please. me at say what sales, and it's all one word on Instagram, on TikTok, and on Twitter. That's where I've been spending a lot of my time. I am rapidly approaching my connection limit on LinkedIn, so uh, you can reach out to me there. Hopefully, I don't have to turn people away. Uh, but I am approaching that limit. I want to thank you for bringing me on the show. Uh, I am in for round two. There's so much about retail that we so wanted much. to cover that we weren't able to cover. And that's just because we have great conversation, man. <laughs> I'm following you. That's true. I'm following you now on um, Instagram at Say What Sales. We need to talk about Twitter separately too because one of my friends who's into like Web3 stuff has said, oh, Twitter's where it's at. And I'm like, man, Twitter I, don't, is where it's I at. don't ever get on Twitter. So now I'm kind of like, I used to call Twitter a hater, but now I'm like, okay, maybe we actually need to, Yo, I'm happy to talk Twitter and retail and social selling in the retail world. We should have that conversation next time. Okay. And I'm going to send you uh, a letter in the mail about getting on Twitter. Um, Sounds great. 
just because it's, you know, anti, it's, it's the exact opposite of what you could do. You're going to send um, me a letter about getting on Twitter. About getting, hey, Mr. Buckley, please tell me, how do I create this handle? Um, <laughs> I actually have some handles. I just haven't used them in a while. But, hey, this has been another episode of The Longer Game. There is a, now a guaranteed part two that's going to be coming up uh, with James Say What Sales Buckley because there's so much conversation to have. And there is just too much to talk about. So I'm, I'm thankful for him coming on. I get at him on Instagram, LinkedIn. I've seen his content on LinkedIn. It's very high quality. I'm now following him on Instagram. And uh, his picture is great. His, his main image, um, <laughs> just repping, repping, repping the company is like, you know, like it's no big deal. Like it's early day. I might as well just be a tattoo. Um, but he's a great guy, and I'd highly recommend if you need help with sales, please reach out to him. I know he's definitely given me some some words of wisdom, which I'm appreciative for. Thank you, my friend. But um, yeah, yeah, you're welcome. But this is you know this is where we talk about retail. And the future of retail is that retail is very fractured. People are making purchase decisions based off of social media, off of Amazon, uh, off of the brand's website, off of reviews. There's so many things that they're factoring in, and so you have to be in multiple places to really really grow your brand. So. Um, that's it, people. The end of the show is here. Uh, and like we end most shows, I just say, that's it. We're done. See you later. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Longer Game. We genuinely appreciate your time. And if you want to connect with us, please reach out to thelongergame.com. You can fill out a contact request form there. You can also find us on majority of the social media platforms, except for Hater. I mean, Twitter. That's the only one that we're not really on. This show is brought to you by my agency, Cartology. We're helping brands accelerate growth and become profitable on Amazon. If you'd like to know more, go to thinkcartology.com, fill out a contact form, and we'll get on the phone. That's what, that's what it's all about, connecting with you and building a relationship. This show is also brought to you by Arch Dev Ops. They are the ones that are helping make all the logistics of this podcast happen. We are so thankful for them. If you want to get your podcast up and running and you want to automate as many things as possible, go to archdevops.com. That's A-R-C-H-D-E-V-O-P-S.com and reach out to them. They can be super, super helpful. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you have a great rest of your day and be blessed.